we normally have a circadian rhythm, um, this beautiful sort of 24 hour rhythm. And we human beings, we're diurnal and we like to sleep at night, be awake during the day. The day. We have this awesome upswing of our circadian rhythm, sort of once we wake up, sort of seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, it starts to peak during the day. It drops down a little bit in the mid afternoon. And that's why you sort of get around meeting tables in the middle of the afternoon, <laughs> these sort of, you know, head nods. Um, it's not people listening to good music. It's like actually, it, there's a pre-programmed dip in your alertness. And then it rises back up and then it drops down at night. Um, and one of the ways that you can get this sort of what you would want, which is a nice sinusoidal wave. You want a nice strong peak of the circadian rhythm during the day so that you're awake and you're active during the day and you're productive. And then you want a, an awesome sort of trough throughout the night right. so that you sleep soundly, deeply, and in a stable fashion. And the way that you can sort of help your circadian rhythm have that wonderful peak and delightful trough is by getting lots of daylight during the day, but lots of darkness during the night. And we are a dark deprived society in this modern era, and it is a huge problem in the evening. But I think people have underestimated that we are a light deprived society during the day. So what happens is that your brain goes through life in this kind of almost stupor state where it's not getting enough daylight to really keep it ramped up throughout the day. So you're sleepy throughout the day and you're tired, but then we've got too much light in the evening. So you end up being awake at night. So you're, and then you're sleepy during the day, you're awake at night. And so it's, you know, it's almost like a, um, I would call it a seesaw, I think it, we call it a teeter mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, during the day you want daylight to come in and force you all the way onto the on switch and you're active and awake. And then at night you want the signal of darkness to come in to trigger the release of a hormone called melatonin to shift you all the way into the off position. So you go into deep sleep and a sound sleep. Even on a cloudy day, uh -huh. the lux intensity of light mm -hmm. far exceeds that that you would have from incandescent light or at sort of typical lights in a, inside of a building. But what's fascinating is that when you look at hunter-gatherer tribes or these experiments um, of, of sort of true nature, um, the natural point of middle point of sleep, the middle phase sort of time of the eight to nine hour sleep phase came somewhere between midnight and 1 p.m. And I often ask people this question, you know, have you ever thought about what the term midnight actually means? Mm -hmm. You know, it means the middle of the, the solar night, which is the time when most of us should be in the middle of our sleep phase. But now in the 21st century, we've gone through the, you know, the agrarian sort of, you know, pushed into the industrial era and now into the digital era. Now midnight is the time when we maybe check Facebook for the last time or think about sending that last email. So not only has the duration of our sleep decreased, um, through the influence of um, modern of the modern times, but also when we're sleeping has been dramatically shifted too. Right. Temperature is as powerful a trigger of sleep organization and sleep depth as light is. And sleep depth. And sleep depth as well. Mm. Um, so what typically happens is that for you to fall asleep and stay asleep, your body needs to drop its core temperature by about one degree Celsius or about sort of two to three degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the reason that you will always find it easier to fall asleep in a room that's too cold than too hot, because the room that's too cold is at least taking you, taking you in the right thermal mm -hmm. direction for good sleep. It's dragging your body down into a cooler realm. So this comes back to our modern homes where we go into offices and we don't necessarily have the rising warmth of the day to activate us because we're set at 70 degrees. And then we go home and our thermostats are set at 70 degrees again. Um, or whatever your standard temperature is. And we don't get the thermal cue mm. through our mm. bodies to say it's time for sleep. So no wonder our sleep is worse. The benefit of exercise. So exercise also has a, a, a really nice, powerful benefit on sleep. Although it's a two way street and, and remind me to talk about right. that in, in a good way. But something else has occurred to me with soreness too. And, and I was thinking about this because I think, I, I, I know that you're a fan. I think you've mentioned this before. Um, one of the ways that you can induce sleep is that you can increase a lot of the immune factors, things like uh, cytokines, um, you know, things also like TNF alpha, you can, uh, or BDNF. IL-6. Um, IL-6, yeah. um, IL-1 even more so, but IL-6. I think- Wow, that's what, so fascinating. So, so now we're all starting to sort of, you know, realize how the sleep system is augmented. One of those paths, you know, is light. The other is darkness. The other is temperature. But here's a fourth one the immune system. Mm -hmm. And we know that you can inject 
um, you know, some of these cytokines into animals, and you can almost induce sleep. It's that powerful. That's so so cool. now I'm starting to think, I wonder if some of the sauna-based benefits and some of the exercise benefits, because when you exercise, you also typically get right. some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines that sort of get released to perhaps deal with some of, you know, the, the the essential, the stress, oh, and you know, I think we've both spoken about this. That you so is that why, like, if you're exercising a lot, you do seem to require more sleep, or you sleep more? I, I, well, we don't know Maybe, that, but that's makes, my yeah, that's theory, a great which is that yeah. you know, you you know, so are you going to test that? That's awesome. Yeah, we're going to test. So we we've just actually been looking at studying not with um, exercise or with saunas, but we've actually been looking at sleep and pain. Mm. And when you deprive people of sleep, you get a chronic release of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is not a good situation. Acute, right. great, somnogenic, good for the body, um, but chronic long-term, and we're starting to piece together a brain-body-sleep-pain interaction, which I think has, we haven't published this yet, but should have marked implications for the hospital environment, because the one place where you do not get a good night of sleep, where it's architected against the night of sleep, is the one place where you need sleep the most, and it's usually the one place where you are in pain the most. What's causing that longevity benefit? Because we know, for example, that the shorter your sleep, the shorter your life. That short sleep predicts all-cause mortality. It's also probably one of the most significant lifestyle factors determining whether or not you'll develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, and all of these things I know have been linked to, for example, sauna use, which is longevity, decreased yeah. susceptibility to development of dementia and cognitive decline, is part of that. I, it's not, I'm not trying to say it's all about sleep. But you know, I really, sleep, you know, I've you know. one of my major interests is aging, increasing health span, as well as performance without the trade off. Yeah. And every, every time I always come back to sleep. The studies, I mean, there's it, it's just constantly coming back in my face how important sleep is. You know, there is no physiological system that we've been able yeah. to measure that isn't wonderfully enhanced by sleep when you get it or demonstrably impaired when you don't get enough. Right. Um, you take a group of individuals and you're not going to deprive them of sleep for an entire night. You're simply going to limit them, restrict them to four hours of sleep for one single night. And then we're going to measure the amount of reduction in natural killer cell activity. So just to take a step back, natural killer cells are a critical part of your immune defense arsenal. And today, both you and I and everyone listening to this podcast, we, have all, we all have cancer cells that have emerged in our bodies. But typically what prevents those cells from becoming this disease that we call cancer is in part these natural killer cells. So what you wish for is a virile set of these sort of immune assassins, these sort of James Bond-like, you know, that they will annihilate these foreign organisms. You want a virile set of those at all times. So take a group of healthy people, um, limit them to four hours of sleep for one night, and what you see is a 70% reduction in natural killer cell activity, 7-0. That is an alarming state of immune deficiency, and it happens quickly, essentially, after one bad night of sleep. So you can imagine you know, the state of your immune system after weeks, if not years, of insufficient sleep. Another great study done by Eric Proffer, who is over at UCSF, another good colleague of mine, he did this brilliant study that I write about in the book. He basically um, measured the sleep of a group of healthy people for a week before using these wristwatches that are accurate. And then he quarantined them in a hotel, in a set of hotel rooms. Um, and then he proceeded to stuff up their nose, squirt up their nose, um, rhinovirus, essentially, um, a flu virus. And then he quarantined them for a week and he measured how many of them became infected. And he was measuring all sorts of stuff. He, he, he collected every ounce of snot that they blew out of their nose, all of the mucus, everything. And what he found was that if you're those people who were getting five hours of sleep or less in the week before they came in and were infected, relative to those who were getting seven hours of sleep or more. Those people who were getting five hours of sleep in the week before they got infected were four times more likely to end up developing the flu than those wow. people who were getting seven hours or more. We know that testosterone in men plummets when sleep gets short. In fact, men who are sleeping five hours or less will have a level of testosterone, which is that of someone 10 years their senior. Wow. Which, so in other words, a lack of sleep will age a man by a decade in terms of that aspect of virility and wellness. How quickly does that happen, do you know? Is that like... So you can see that within almost days once you start oh. to dose people on that. It comes about quite rapidly. Um, you can see hormonal change. I mean, I think that's what, if, if there is a major access, uh, sorry, axis within the body that is altered by sleep, it is the hormonal axis. Um, and this is um, uh, a colleague, Dr. Nedergarden, who is out um, on the East Coast uh, at the University of Rochester. And she made, the, she made two wonderful discoveries. The first, 
was that we've known for a long time the body has a waste sewage system called the lymphatic system. But the brain doesn't have it, its own lymphatic system. The, the lymphatic system does not penetrate the brain. So what, where does all of the, the garbage, the metabolic garbage go that your brain cells produce? Where's the sewage system for the brain? And she discovered it. It's actually made up of a set of cells called glial cells, which are these supporting brain cells. And so she called it the glymphatic system rather than the lymphatic system. So your brain does have a sewage system, this glymphatic system. And that's the discovery that she made. Remarkable. Then, and I'm not quite sure what motivated her to do this, she started to measure how efficient that glymphatic, that waste system was when the rats were awake and when the rats were asleep. And what she found was that it's during deep sleep that these brain cells actually shrink by almost 60% when we sleep. Blows my mind. Yeah. It's almost like you know all of the buildings in New York all of a sudden shrink and it leaves these much greater larger areas for the cleaning crews to come in and clean up all of the metabolic detritus of the city's activity during the day. That's exactly what happens during sleep. And the, the cleaning solution is what we call cerebrospinal fluid. And the, through a pulsatile mechanism during sleep, you get a 10 to 20% increase in the bathing of cerebrospinal fluid, fluid through the brain, which washes away all of the metabolic um, uh, byproducts that have been building up. If you're not getting enough deep sleep at night, you're not giving yourself the chance for the kind of good night and sleep clean process to remove the beta amyloid. So more beta amyloid builds up. Where does it build up? Tragically, in the very same regions of the brain that generate the deep sleep that you need to clear out the toxic amyloid. So you start getting less deep sleep, so you get more toxic protein, more toxic protein, less deep sleep, less deep sleep. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it's a non-linear exponential curve.